I know, at least, at least it's not like Teresa's first Mother's Day where uh, we had, uh, I've preached on controlling women, which uh, <laughs> that, I learned my lesson then for sure. <laughs> well, you ready for Yeah, yeah. Father, we do come before you, and, and just as I was walking up here, what really came to me that we just say, uh, lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in, who is the King of glory, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be that the King of you ancient, lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. And Lord, we welcome your presence. We thank you that your presence is here, oh God. And even if, there, if you're here, we know the mighty angels are here. We thank you for how, what you have done. You have done great things for us. And we just stand in awe of, of what you were doing, oh God, in this hour and what you have done, that you are the God of the second chance. And Lord, we thank you for the word that you have given Ken. And I just ask that you take him aside and that you speak through him, not by power nor by might, but by the spirit of God and that every mountain and hill will be laid low and every valley be lifted up that you will be seen, King of glory, that you will be seen in the midst of us today. And Lord, we just thank you for what you are doing. And we thank you for the word that you have given to him. And we thank you that your words are spirit and they are life, that they are life-giving. And we thank you and give you praise in Jesus' name. Yes, amen. amen. Okay, there we go. All right, amen, amen. Let me get organized here. I have to uh, print out the scripture verses nowadays. The, the uh, print on my Bible is getting smaller and smaller. It's amazing how that happens. The older you get, the print seems like it shrinks. I don't know how that works out, but uh, it seems to be the case. But uh, Anyway, I have like all my scriptures printed out in size 16 font, so I can, with my glasses, I think I can read them, so. All right, amen. Um, I'm gonna teach today, on, uh, the title of the message that, that I've got is called Unto Readiness, Unto Readiness. And I think a lot of you know that uh, I'm write, rewriting the bride book for life school. And uh, so that's kind of been on my heart you, you know, for the last uh, couple of months. And so really the messages that I've been teaching are kind of themes that kind of go into, intertwined into that book that I'm writing. Um, and so this one is one more along those lines. I've, I've preached two other times, I think, or maybe more, but I think two other times this year. And uh, the, the two messages that really kind of form a series in a sense. The one I did, I think, back in March after we got back from Africa was uh, about communing with Christ, the importance of communing with Christ. And then I did a message uh, in May, I think May 5th, on developing a bridal identity. Uh, and both of those are really, really important. And this message kind of goes along with those. It's kind of like a series along that line of of making yourself ready as a bride. Communing with Christ is essential if you're gonna make yourself ready as a bride for Christ. Uh, and developing a bridal identity is, a, is likewise uh, critical if you're gonna make a, if you're gonna be made ready. And so this one on unto readiness is kind of a follow up of the, of the bridal identity uh, message, uh, although there will be a, a, a number of different points on it. So anyway, that's kind of the introduction. Um, if in the, in the bridal identity message that I did back in uh, May, I talked about three reasons why it's really important to develop a bridal identity. Who knows what they are? <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to ask, actually. That was a joke. I know nobody probably knows. But, uh, but the, the three 
uh, reasons why it's important is that the bride made ready is, is a essential aspect of God's eternal plan and purpose that was established before the foundation of the world. Uh, the second one is that the bride made ready is a critical theme, a, a continuous theme that runs from the beginning of the Bible to the end, from Genesis to Revelation, throughout um, many types and shadows in the Old Testament, the teachings of Jesus while he was here on earth, uh, the New Testament apostles, John and Paul, uh, all taught about that. There's a theme that runs through the scriptures from beginning to end. And then the third uh, aspect that we taught before was that the new covenant is a bridal is a bridal covenant. Now, the new covenant is, is probably, I believe it is more than just a bridal covenant, but it is a bridal covenant. All the steps that Jesus did when he came to earth to, to cut the covenant and to secure, uh, to make a way for people to come into salvation were steps that were part of the ancient Jewish wedding system. So uh, the new covenant, among other things, is a bridal covenant. Now, what I want to talk about today, one more, start with one more point of why it's so important that we focus our lives on making ourselves ready uh, as a bride is that Jesus, at the, at the, uh, as he went to the cross, called, the, called believers to make themselves ready as a bride. Uh, and that's what I want to, I want to start out by showing you that and then we'll go from there into four aspects of, of readiness, unto readiness. But let's talk about, the, the, about Jesus calling believers throughout history to make themselves ready as a bride. But we want to start to do that. We want to start with Revelation 19, verse 7. We've uh, you know, used that verse of Scripture quite a number of times. But I want to read it, and I want to talk about three, uh, three little phrases in that passage. Revelation 19, starting with verse 7. Uh, Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come. For the mar Remember that phrase. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Verse 8. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Uh, I'm not really going to talk much about fine linen today, but if you'll notice, that if you look at the Old Testament and the priesthood, in order to go into the, to minister unto the Lord, the priests had to clothe themselves with fine linen. Uh, and so it's, all, it's, it's, as, it's as though as the bride to be able to minister unto the Lord has to be clothed with spiritual fine linen. Uh, which he says are the righteous acts uh, of the saints. So let's talk uh, about the marriage. I'm going to talk about the marriage has come, the bride has made herself ready, and righteous acts of the saints. This is, I'm setting the stage to go back to when Jesus, last week of Jesus' earthly ministry. The, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. Revelation 19, 7 and 8 uh, is the trigger that initiates the second coming of Christ. Because you see in Revelation uh, 7 and 8, the, the bride has made herself ready. Two or three verses later, the Lord comes back. You can see it starting in verse 11, Revelation 19, verse 11. And so, you know, you've heard all this. It, no matter how dark it gets in the earth, and it's certainly dark right now, no matter how bad it gets, what really is going to initiate the second coming of Christ is the bride being made ready. Now, that doesn't have to be the entire church, but there will be a significant remnant. Only God knows what that remnant number is. But when, the bride, when there is a bridal remnant, a bridal company made ready, then the Lord will come back. Amen? All right, so that makes that in itself puts a, a, a high level of importance on the, the call unto readiness. Uh, now let's look at the bride has made herself ready. Uh, I, want to, I want us to focus for a minute or two on this. The bride has made herself 
ready. Say with me, herself. 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 So there is, a, there is a responsibility that the betrothed bride has to make herself ready uh, for, as a bride for Christ. That's, that's the point I really want to make here. There, there is a responsibility, but yet we're going to find, we're going to see there is a responsibility, but yet we can't do it. We, in and of ourselves, we can't do it. But yet we have a responsibility to do it. Say with me, bridal identity. We need a bridal identity. If we're going to be responsible for making ourselves ready, there needs to be, we need to think of ourselves as a betrothed bride with my life being to make, our, to make myself ready for the bridegroom king. Amen? We can't just ignore it. But let, let's look at the, just a couple of um, uh, what some of the commentators have said about this phrase, the bride has made herself ready. Robert Thomas, I like his commentary. If you're looking for a commentary on the book of Revelation, he has a two-volume commentary on it. It's really, really good, detailed and really good. And he's, he comments about that verse, the bride has made herself ready, saying responsibility of self-preparation uh, re rests on her shoulders. There's a responsibility of self-preparation that rests on, on the shoulders of the betrothed bride to make herself ready. Uh, George Eldon Ladd, I like his commentary as well, he wrote, while the bride must make herself ready for the marriage, her glorious ram remnant clothing is not something she can acquire for herself. It must be granted to her, that is, given to her as a divine gift. And so what he, he brings up that really important point. Only God can clothe us with bridal garments. But yet we have a responsibility to pursue those bridal garments by his grace that we'll, get, we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, so the marriage has come at the end of the age. That's what's going to trigger the second coming. And what triggers the, the marriage coming is the bride has made herself ready. Now let's look at one more phrase, the righteous acts uh, of the saints. Uh, here's a couple more uh, comments from commentators about it. John Walvrood, in his commentary, uh, he wrote this. The word for righteousness is the word for righteous deeds and is in the plural. The reference, therefore, seems to be not just to justification by faith, but rather to the righteousness wrought in the lives of the saints who comprise the wife of the Lamb. <coughs> Righteousness wrought in the lives of the saints who comprise the wife of the Lamb. Robert Thomas, again, he wrote this. Righteous acts are a manifestation of the inner life and are practically equivalent to character. A transformed life is the proper response to the call of the heavenly bridegroom. Uh, so he's talking about inward transformation. Uh, George Eldon Ladd said, wrote this, the saints who are summoned to the Lamb's Feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb, are those who have exercised steadfast endurance, <coughs> who have kept the commandments of God and have persevered in the faith in Jesus. Uh, Vine's Dictionary talks about righteous acts. It's one word in the Greek. And what the Vine's Dictionary talks about is that it is a concrete expression of, of righteousness. So even though there are, we're going to talk a little bit about works in a few minutes, there are works involved in making ourselves ready. It's not about how much more do I need to do. It's not, it has nothing to do, I mean, well, no, it doesn't have anything to do with how much more. I mean, there is participation in the, the work of the gospel, but the predominant uh, issue is inward transformation. Uh, when we're born again, as we talked about in one of the other messages, we are betrothed at the bride of Christ. We are the betrothed bride of Christ. But 
it's not the imputed righteousness that comes at just at the point of salvation, even though that's absolutely necessary in every person's life. It is the uh, transformation uh, of our character uh, through sanctification that makes us ready uh, as a bride for Christ. So it's an inward work of the Spirit, which doesn't necessarily take more time. It takes more surrender. Uh, it's the surrender of our life, like Randa was singing about uh, this morning. The surrender of our life uh, is what brings about the transformation and uh, there are other aspects of it, but that's essentially that is it. So anyway, that's what that's the end of the age. The marriage has come. The bride has made herself ready. Her, she has to participate in it. And it's in, predominantly inward uh, transformation. Okay, so now let's go back to Jesus' last work week uh, on the in, on earth before he went to the cross. Uh, starting in Matthew, you, you can start with like chapter 21 or so, 22. But what did he do? He talked about, Jesus talked about the bride a lot. He talked, Matthew 22 is the, is the parable of the marriage supper where he talks about people going out and inviting people not only to salvation, uh, but also to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, Matthew 22 and putting on bridal garments and those that don't put on the bridal garments are cast into the outer darkness which we talked about um, uh, uh, in some of the other teachings um, again if you really want to get, Matthew 22 is really an important uh, parable and if you look at the theology of the bride I did an entire session on that where I dealt with a, a the outer darkness and being cast out of the, uh, the marriage supper and all that, what that means. It's not losing your salvation, but it's not being able to participate in the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so anyway, he talked about that. He talked about, again, about the bride and the parable of the ten virgins. He talked about, uh, uh, talked about needing oil in your lamps, which is about an internal work. And, and so... There was a, a number of things about the bride, but in this context, there's a call for readiness. There's a call for readiness. Remember Revelation 19, the end of the age, the bride has made herself ready. But as Jesus is going to the cross, he's speaking to his followers, and he says, you need to be ready. You need to be ready. Uh, let's, let's look at Matthew 24. Verse, uh, starting with verse 42. Remember, this is, the, uh, this is during the last week of his, earth, earthly, his time on earth before he went to the cross. And he had talked about the bride. He talked about other things. But he says, here's what he says. The, now, this is not to, just to the, the Pharisees and the others that were gathered there. He's talking to his followers as well. And he says this in verse 42. Therefore... Be on the alert. Uh, in other words, develop a bridal identity, uh, an identity that realizes that at the end of the age, he's coming back for a people who are made ready. Uh, he says, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed the house to be broken into. Then verse 44, For this reason you must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think uh, he will. And then verse 45, this is really a key uh, parable here that kind of uh, sets the stage for some of the things that uh, I'm going to be talking about here in a minute. Verse 45 says this, Who then, because he just said you be ready, and then in verse 45, he says, Who then is the faithful and sensible slave whom the master put in charge of his household to give them the food at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing, so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. Uh, and there's, you know, more there, but... Okay, but the, I want you to focus for a minute on that. Who then is the faithful 
and sensible slave. The word sensible, that's translated sensible there in the Greek, is the same word that is, tra that is translated wise in the parable of the ten virgins. Because remember, Matthew 24, 42 through, 40, for, through 51 ends, pretty much ends chapter 24, and then right at the beginning of 25 is the parable of the ten virgins. And right after that is the parable of the talents, you know, about being faithful with what God has uh, given to you. So here's what he's saying. He's talked about the bride, and he said, who is the faithful and wise slave? In other words, who is the wise virgin? And who is the, the one who's living out, doing business with what God has given to him, the faithful one in the parable of the talents? Uh, he's saying, be found so doing. Be found living out the parable of the ten virgins. Be found living out uh, the parable of the talents. Be found doing, be found so doing these two things. Tar parable of the ten virgins. Uh, internal transformation, internal transformation uh, about the getting oil in, internally in your lamp, the, the work of the Holy Spirit, intimacy and internal work of character. Be found so doing those things. Remember Revelation 19, the bride has made herself ready. You know, participate in those issues that produce that oil uh, internally uh, within your lamp. Uh, but then he goes on right after that, immediately following that, is the parable of the talents. Uh, and so that leads to uh, not just being, but doing. So what is the parable of talents? You've been given, you've been given something by God. Uh, do business with it. Uh, do, do business with that so that the parable of the talents. People are given different giftings, different levels of, of things, but they're to do business with those things. And so that puts the call into a kind of a couple of ways. One, internal transformation, uh, and secondly, doing business with what God, is, the gifting that God has given to you, work, service, ministry. Both are necessary, are part uh, of making ourselves ready. You know, we see in Luke, we see the same thing. I, I like the way this reads, Luke 12, 35. Be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit. Uh, be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast so that they may, may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those whom the master will uh, find on the alert when he comes. And so he, again, he talks about being ready. So here, here's the issue. Revelation 19, the end of the age, the bride has made herself ready. But Jesus, when he is going to the cross, cutting the new covenant, the bridal covenant to betroth the bride, He's saying to the bride, the betrothed bride, and all who would be the betrothed bride throughout history, at the end of the age, even though he didn't say it in these words, what he was saying was at the end of the age, you're going to be evaluated and judged based on you as a bride having been made ready. Uh, and he says, so he's given a summons, an invitation, a challenge. As he's going to the cross, he's saying, that's, how, that's what's going to happen at the end of the age. So here's the call. Make yourself ready. As he was getting ready to go to the cross, he was saying, be ready. Be on the alert. Stay focused. Be on the alert. Be making yourself ready. Uh, do you see that? It, it's a, to me, it's an amazing picture. It's a challenging one for all of us, for sure. But it, what, it, what it is is that He's calling his church to make themselves ready. And so that's why we need a bridal identity. We need to stay alert. We need to stay focused on those things. Uh, you know, that's why we need to pay attention 
to give attention to making ourselves ready by God's grace. Amen. Let me hear an amen. 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 Let me hear a louder amen. 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 All right. Okay. All right. That's the call. Okay. Make ourselves ready. That's a, that's as a bride for Christ. Now let's go. I want to share uh, four dynamics for readiness that we've shared some other things in the message on bridal identity, but I want to share four things here. Number one, these are attitudes that we need to make sure we have in our lives uh, if we're going to be making ourselves ready. Uh, number one, you are sought after, loved, and cherished on the journey of readiness. You're sought after, you're loved, and you're cherished on the journey of readiness. You know, sometimes we, we have this... You know, life can get hard at times, and you think, oh, does God even love me? Does God even care about me? I feel like, you know, he's angry with me. What, what is it in my life? Uh, 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 you know, what kind of sin am I doing that I don't even know about or whatever that causes me to be so angry at me to have to go through all this stuff? Well, the truth is, he loves you. And, you know, we've heard, we've heard this since Sunday school, you know. Uh, Jesus loves me, you know. But, so, but it's, it's a hard thing to really grasp when we see our own flesh and our own sin and, uh, you know, maybe circumstances that have gone opposite ways. But the scriptures teach with great clarity and in abundance that you are all along the journey in your immaturity at the beginning and even in your, matur and in your maturity. You are loved by Christ you're sought after by him, and you're cherished by him. Let me talk a little bit about that. Uh, and probably every one of us need to hear this point right now. We all need to hear it, and especially if we've been going through trials or we're having a hard time overcoming a particular issue or whatever, a sin issue or a self issue. Uh, you know, we feel like, oh, man, God doesn't even love me because of that. You are sought after. You are loved. Let's talk about first being sought after. I love uh, Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17. This is verse 24. He's praying to the Father right before he gets ready to go to the cross. He said, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am. He desires you to be with him where he, where he was. Even before and that verse ends, you love me even before the foundation of the world. John 1.18 says that before the foundation of the world, Jesus was, uh, was in the bosom of the Father. Before the foundation of the world, they were one together in eternity past. And what is he saying? I, I desire. Jesus said, I desire you to be there with me. With me in intimacy in the bosom of the Father. So, I mean, that's his heart. That's his heart. He desires you. He seeks after you. He, he wants you. I mean, you know, even, uh, you know, some of the parables, you know, the, the one, the lost sheep, he leaves the 99 to go after the one to bring them too. He, he loves you. And even in difficult situations, difficult trials, uh, know that God seeks, he seeks after you. And the trials, I don't understand some of the things that people have to go through. I, I, honestly, I don't understand it. But we have to hang on to that truth that he seeks, he seeks after us, he loves us, and he cherishes us. Now let's talk for a minute about love. He, saw, he seeks you. He's, you're sought after by the, by the Lord. Sought after because he wants to rule with you for, and partner with you forever and ever and ever through the eternal ages. Now let's talk about love. I, you know, there's so many places you could go, but I, I love the Song of Songs. Uh, it's a journey of a, the bride and the bridegroom from the beginning of an awakening in her heart all the way to the point where she is mature in that love. In Song, uh, Psalm, Song of Solomon or Song of Songs 1 verse 2, 
She says, may he kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. In other words, may he uh, have an intimate relationship with the, I mean, this is totally spiritual and not in any way sexual or, or romantically, but it can, I want to be drawn to him in a closeness. Why? Because his love is better than wine or any earthly pleasure. His love is better than any of those things. And so what does she do? She has a revelation. That's what begins her journey. She has a revelation that Christ loves her. And we need that, that Christ loves, you, loves her. Now, this is at the very beginning of her journey in maturity. She's very immature. She's just beginning the journey here. And so she says, draw me after you and let us run together. And then even early on in chapter 1, verse 5, she says, I am black but lovely. And so when she's talking about that, she is talking about the darkness of her heart and the darkness of the sin in her life. And she says, you know, there's, there's a, I've just started this journey and I've got all kind of issues there that are not good, but I'm still lovely in your sight. And that's the way God looks at us. We're on this journey. And he doesn't want us to stay in our immaturity but he loves us all along this journey. Then in chapter 4, verse 9, uh, the bride ravishes or the, the, makes the heart beat faster of the bridegroom uh, with a single glance of her eyes. The love he has uh, for her. This time, at this point, she has decided that she would go to the cross. She would embrace the cross, surrender to the work of the cross, uh, in her life in order to be made ready as his, as his bride. And out of that, it just it touches the heart of the bridegroom. You've ravished my heart with this thing, with this, when you have done that. Then going on to chapter 6, he says, Of her, you're as beautiful as Terza, my darling, as lovely as Jerusalem. You're as awesome as an army with banners. This is when she's begun to overcome. You know, that's how they, the army got banners. They would, they would take the enemy's banners. And by the end, after, after a while, they had all the enemy's banners. And, and there, it's a picture of, an, of our overcoming. You know, you have a banner when you've overcome this. You have a banner when you've overcome that. And so as she's begun to overcome, it's just, it, 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 it just touches the heart of the Lord in an amazing, amazing way. Uh, and then finally, uh, in chapter 8, this put me as a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. Uh, so it talks about the intimacy and the closeness and the oneness that is there. So the point is that all along the journey, not only are you sought after, you are loved. You're loved in your weakness. You're loved at the beginning. You're loved as you mature. You're loved at the, the end of the journey. You are sought after and you are loved. Now let's just talk just for a second about cherished. Cherished means to care for, to protect, to hold, and to treat as dear. Treat as dear. You know, Paul talked about that in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, talking about marriage uh, and talking about the groom needs to, to love and to cherish. We say this in, in the wedding vows and everything, but it talks about that in Ephesians 5, 28 and, 20, uh, and 29 especially. Says, Nobody's hated their own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. And this is in the context of marriage. So it's in the context of the church as the bride. In the context of the church as the bride, then the bridegroom nourishes and cherishes us. He holds you as dear. He thinks, thinks of you as one he loves. Now, this is really, really important for us to understand. If we're going to, if we're going to be on this journey of readiness, because, you know, I was sharing this on the, when we were on the prayer line, you know, with somebody. I forgot who it was. But I said, you know, there's a lot of the years of, uh, of, of our journey as a church uh, where, uh, 
you know, I, I don't know if any of you, may, any of y'all remember, you might be too young for this, the movie, uh, the TV show, Hee Haw, anybody? You know, they had, they had this saying, if it weren't for bad news, there'd be no news at all. You remember them saying they were, and uh, after we started the church, uh, that was, I mean, for a while there, I felt like I was part of the Hee Haw gang. If it weren't for bad news, there'd be no news at all. And so, you know, part of the readiness process is a deep breaking of all kind of issues in your in your heart, um, and those can be very very painful, as it, probably everybody in here knows. Uh, uh, but so we have to really know that He loves us and He cherishes us and He's seeking after us, even in the hard times. He's doing a work. He's doing a work in us to make us ready as a bride. So that we can partner with him for the eternal throughout the eternal ages, uh, you know he's going to put it as we read a minute ago. He wants to put us in charge of all of his possessions. I mean, think about that. The King of the Universe, the Creator of the Universe, wants to give you authority throughout the ages. But there's a work of preparation that has to take place, a deep work. And it's painful. But he loves you all along the way. I mean, that's a, I, mean I don't know. I hope that's touching you. It's touching me. Really. Amen. Okay, that's the first point. Uh, I'll try to move a little bit quicker on the rest of them. Uh, okay, still got a few more minutes. The second dynamic is to endure the journey, you must learn to enjoy your relationship with God. To enjoy your relationship with God. Uh, really, really important. You know, um, Don and I talk about this. Um, you know, I, I mean, I love my relationship with the Lord, but I don't really like to do projects around the house. Would you agree that I do? It's like, oh, I don't want to do that, you know, kind of thing. Um, and so when I, since I don't really like doing projects around this, our, our to-do, my honey-do list gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and I've even had to put a, like a, a, a temporary ban on we need, honey, we need, or Kenny, there's more Kenny. Kenny, we need to. I got, um, I got my, I got some hearing aids now. I got, uh, uh, and then when I had my hearing tested, it was like, they, they did a, showed me a little chart. You know, men's voices I could hear fine. Women's voices, it was like, especially, you know, they would say like, uh, they would tell me, okay, what word am I saying? Go. And I would say, go. Uh, or, hello. Hello. Kenny, we need to. <laughs> so now I can hear. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it, I don't think it's going to change anything. Uh, but I still don't like projects. Uh, but I do enjoy God. I do, and this is really important. This is really important. Now, the way I enjoy God may be totally different from the way you enjoy your relationship with God. We're all like a snowflake. We're all different. But we need to develop our own relationship where we enjoy God. Uh, now, what I enjoy doing, uh, I mean, I enjoy, uh, I enjoy my time with the Lord. I enjoy the studying the scriptures uh, and, and getting the revelation from the scriptures. I enjoy my private worship. I, you know, I enjoy writing and journaling. Uh, you know, I enjoy that. Uh, give one example about, about private worship. It's not so much now, but back in when we were at the other house, we, you know, I was down in the den and all the bedrooms were upstairs and uh, that was back before YouTube and all that. And so I, the, I had a CD player and I would get these headphones on where I could, all I could hear was beautiful worship music and I was singing along with it. 
and all the family could hear was me singing. And so, uh, Quentin, show that uh, video. Stephen took a video of Liam, and I said, this is kind of what it sounded like to the other people. Is it up there? Okay. It's worth the wait. <laughs> Maybe that's because I pray on Grandpa, but it was funny to me. Still working on it, or well, where are we on it? Make sure we have the sound up. We... Is there sound? Is there? <laughs> So to me, when I was singing, it was like beautiful music because all I could hear was what was on the headphones. And all they could hear was Bible, I, ba, ba, ba. <laughs> uh, but, but the point is, I enjoyed it. Uh, I mean, I remember, I'll tell one more story. I remember I, for one, one day I got up really early. I forgot now why. I just woke up, I guess. And I was doing it, singing like that, and Donna was at the top of the stairs. Will you be quiet down there? I'm somebody's trying to sleep down there, up there. <laughs> but anyway, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. And I enjoyed the scripture. But the, you know, the point I'm trying to make is if you're going to be on this journey, a marathon journey, you, you've got to develop a relationship with Christ where you enjoy encountering him. It can't be... I'm just going to hold my nose and I'm going to make myself ready. Uh, we won't do it for a long period of time. Uh, we, so to, to be on the lifelong journey of readiness, we have to have this relationship where we enjoy uh, God. Um, now, one more, uh, one more point. I, I want to also add this because this is an issue I think, I don't know this is an issue here, but it, you know we're online as well. But it's a, uh, we've heard this a lot. We have to enjoy God, but we also need to enjoy life. Need to enjoy life. Now, I don't mean we need to go party or something like that, anything that's sinful or inconsistent with our walk. But it's really important, it's really important to, to, to enjoy uh, other things. This is my, my take on it. Uh, you know, we, we've encountered people who, you know, I'm, I'm going to withdraw from everything other than relationship with God. And, you know, I think God does a lot in us when we're interacting with other people. You know, I... And I, you know, I enjoy, I, I like, I enjoy, I don't think this is wrong. I, I enjoy like going to the grandkids' ball games. You know, I, I enjoy watching them. I, I enjoy, uh, you know, certain, I enjoy, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not saying we enjoy sinful things, but there's, there's a, there's a mindset I think it kind of comes from some of the mystics, the mid, you know, age mystics, where to be right with God, you've got to pull away from everything. Now, that may be the case for some. If you feel that's what you're supposed to do, then do it. But, but I really believe that there's, that there's enjoyment in life. You know, I try, I mean, I, the days of being Father's Day, um, you know, I don't know if they really meant it. I think they did. But all, the guys said, Oh, Dad, you're an amazing father, and you're, and even if they don't mean it, I'm glad they said it. But I think they do mean it. You know, you're an amazing dad. You're do, you know, and we really appreciate you. But you know, if I had pulled away from the from them in order to just me and God, not only would I have got, wouldn't have got those words. Who know, Who knows where they, they probably wouldn't even be walking with the Lord right. It's a good chance they wouldn't. And so it's really, really enjoying life is really 
it, really important. And, and I know, uh, I don't know that there's anybody here that hit, is, this hits, but I know just from our conversations with others outside of the house, it's a mindset. Uh, and it's so important that, you know, your, your kid's biggest fan at their ball games or whatever they're, whatever they're doing. Um, so anyway, enjoy God and enjoy life. Uh, that's the second point. I only have 17 more points to make here. No, not that, that bad. Two more. Uh, okay, number three, it is by God's grace that we are transformed. It's by God's grace that we are transformed. Um, this, this is really uh, an important point as well. Uh, you know, grace has a lot of different meanings. Grace has a lot of different meanings in the scriptures, but the one that I want to draw from is 2 Corinthians 12, where Jesus said to Paul, you know, my strength is, per my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is perfected in your weakness. And so that aspect of grace is that one of the definitions of grace is it's, it is God's power directed toward your point of need. God's power directed toward your point of need. That's grace. Um, in other words, remember we talked about uh, in Revelation 19 a minute ago that you can't, uh, you can't make yourself ready, yet you're responsible for it. Uh, only God can give you the, the, you know, it was granted to them to find Leonard, but yet they had to make themselves ready. So it's almost like, okay, how do, I can't do anything about it, but yet I'm responsible for it. How does that work? Well, the answer is it's God's grace. His power directed toward uh, that area of need. And so, you know, part of it is just walking with the Lord and, and his grace is, is sufficient and he just does things in your life. But then part of it is, you know, there is, a, there is an issue I have to overcome. I know I've got to overcome it and I don't know how to do it. Well, that's where only God's grace can help you overcome that issue. You cannot do it on your own. As much as you try, you cannot do it on your own. Only the divine power of God directed toward that issue can overcome that issue uh, in your life. God's grace. But some people, again, I don't know if it affects anybody here, but I know just from our conversations with many others, some people have the mindset that because it's God's grace and I can't really do anything to change, I'm going to sit back in my recliner and let God do everything. And just I'm just going to go through life not uh, seeking uh, any kind of transformation or readiness in other words, not being alert, as Jesus said, just go through life, float through life, because only God can change me. That's not a right attitude. Yes, only he can change you, but when you say, but he must make myself ready, then we must put energy into it, realizing that we can't actually do it, but we have to put energy into it. You know, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for what? Hunger and thirst for righteousness. In other words, inward transformation of our character, for they should be satisfied. And so there's, we can't do it, but we got to hunger and thirst for it. We got to put in energy into it. We got to try, we got to put uh, uh, re requests. And so, the term I've used over the years is aggressive grace, aggressive grace, not passive grace, aggressive grace. When there's an issue that comes up, I need to say, Lord, help me overcome this issue. I can't, I've got a res responsibility, but I can't do it. Aggressively great, cry out for God to come. And he answers, uh, he answers those prayers. I think in a general sense, one of the prayers that ought to be part of our life on a regular basis is just like Paul said in Galatians 4.19, uh, you know, I labor until Christ is formed in you. Let's labor a little bit in prayer uh, in our own lives and say, Lord, form Christ in me. 
for, you know, that's, it's only, he can do it, grace, but it's not passive. It's, it's, Paul is asking in his case for the church, but, and we can pray for the church too, but let's pray for ourselves. Lord, form Christ in me. I want, I want to be made ready as your bride. And I know I can't do it, but I know there's a responsibility there. Please make me ready as your bride. I mean, I pray that prayer, not every day, but I do pray it periodically, uh, fairly regularly, to make myself ready as a bride. Uh, and, you know, then he'll come and he'll put you into a horrible situation where everything's falling apart. And, uh, you know, no, I don't know that he'll do that. But, it, but it, uh, uh, just ask for him to do that because at the end of the age, it's, it's, uh, we're going to be evaluated based on readiness. Okay. Great, that was grace. Okay, now one more point, and uh, we'll be through here in just a, just a minute. Um, readiness includes Holy Spirit-led works. It, uh, it includes Holy Spirit-led works. Uh, now, I'm hitting on issues that, again, I don't know that they're affected here, but I know just from different encounters, I, I know it's, it's a mindset on some. Some people have the idea that readiness is just me and Jesus. You know, I'll focus on my internal relationship with Christ, and as I focus on that internal relationship with Christ, he'll make me ready. There's no even thought with... Uh, you know, works, which I would, you know, call ministry, uh, works of service, um, acts of compassion, words of encouragement, different things externally beyond internal transformation. And, and I think, again, some of the mystic teachings kind of focus on you pull away from everything and everybody and just focus on you and God. Well, that is not what the scriptures teach to start with. And it's not what is going to help you to be fully made ready. Yes, predominantly what God is looking for is internal transformation of our character. But that does not exclude doing things as part of the evaluation that we're going uh, to have. Um, you know, I won't read all of this too much, but if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, starting with verse 7, and goes through about 15, what's, Paul's talking about the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, and remember, when the bride is made ready, uh, I mean, my interpretation of the scripture is that being the eternal wife of the Lamb will be an eternal reward granted to the bride who has made herself ready. So that will be determined at the judgment seat of Christ. And Michael talked about that in his message a, a while ago. It'll be about the, the bride uh, made ready. He said, let me start with verse 7. So then neither one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to to his own labor, according to his own labor. You know, they're sowing and planting, uh, but we're all fellow workers of God's field. In verse 10, according to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. Uh, so anyway, you know, he's talking about works there. And so if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident for the day will show it. The judgment seat of Christ will show it. Uh, and so we'll receive a reward. If any man's work which has been built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If not, it will be burned up. He'll suffer loss, but he will be saved. Now, so... Service, works, ministry is a part of that. But there's several different attitudes there toward that. That, and, you know, on Friday morning, this past Friday morning, 
Uh, I woke up about five o'clock in the morning. I didn't get out of bed, but the Lord began to give me like five or six different categories of how work, service, ministry fit in. It's way too much uh, to do right now uh, on Father's Day, unless y'all want another 30 or 45 minute message. Anybody want that? Okay. <laughs> no, no, thank you. Um, so I won't talk about it in, in detail, but it, the works that aren't going to be burned up are spirit-led, spirit-empowered, uh, spirit-empowered messages, spirit-empowered works and service and ministry. Um, you know, there's an attitude, one attitude, one extreme is do no work, no service, no ministry. The other is do as much as I can possibly do. Neither one of those are right. Uh, the, the ones you do as much as you can do, that'll all, a lot of it, most of it probably will get burned up, up at the judgment seat. So there's a lot more to it, but I won't get into that. But if you look at it, I'll just say this about works, is that the parable of the talents, you know, Jesus said, who is the faithful and wise servant? Let him be found so doing. The parable, the, the, the parable of ten virgins talks about internal transformation. The parable of the talents talks about doing business with what God has given to you, how he's gifted you. And so, uh, so work, service, ministry are important. You know, you got to be, you know, if it's just what you want to do, it gets burned up at the judgment seat. If it's what God has called you to do uh, and empowered you to do, then it produces part of producing the, your eternal reward. Uh, and so we need, to, we need to balance these four dynamics. Your love sought after cherished. You need to enjoy God. It's by grace that we're transformed. And uh, works are an aspect of it, uh, but those called and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let me pray. Father. Help us to be ready, Lord. We ask for you to help us to be ready. And we ask for your anointing upon each and everything, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Look, I know it's Father's Day, and I don't want to take us too long, but let's just stand up.